rob you. Mm. Hallelujah. So all of this good stuff that the Lord's done for us is now where we lived in chaos and darkness. It's a new adventure. We moved over into the light. We walk in the light as he is in the light. We have fellowship one with another. The blood of Christ his son cleanses us from all unrighteousness. Boy, is this how it feels to be for me? It does for me. I made a choice to move over into freedom. Get off of the proverbial guilt trip. Self-condemnation. I'm a failure. I can never get it right. God's mad at me. Everything's going in reverse for me. Nothing's working right. Why is all these bad things? Glory. Hallelujah. So I'm living in victory. What victory? Mine? Christ. Gain a sense. I, I just live in his victory. Live, live, move, have our be. That's where I'm living. It's freedom. It's freedom from fear. It's liberty. It's, there's no bondage. What, what's, what's good for me is people can no longer hold things against me. I just live in truth. I live in love. They can say all manner of evil falsely against me. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me. Because I had a reputation. I wanted you to think good of me. I had a reputation. Had to, I had to, had to watch over it. certain things I wanted people to know, certain things I didn't know. I always wrestled with what Paul said. Your lives ought to be open books, living epistles, seen and read of all men. So when the Holy Ghost said, I think I want you to learn to make of yourself no record. I said, why, Holy Ghost? I do it. I'll start walking. Start living it out. I'll see. So I started living it out. I said, I'll be at the altar. That's what you hear in your prayer. Why have you got, why are you, why are you praying, God, get a speck out of your brother's eye? You Get the tree out of yours, and you can see. Prefer your brother. If you go ever go correct your brother, prefer your brother or your sister better than yourself. How do you know that you belong to Jesus? Because you love your brother. If you don't love your brother, Scripture says you're lying. Believers love their brothers and sisters. They do. If you don't, I'm not, this isn't what I, I'm not making this up. You'll see it in First John tonight. You love the, the identifying hallmark of belief in Christ and a Christ follower, a believer. Remember what Moeller told us about love? I'm not trying to be a better Christian. I'm trying to believe better. I need to be a better believer. What Jesus always challenged was their belief system. Why do you doubt? Oh, you of little faith. Where is your faith? What's going on? What do you believe? Lord, that I might receive my sight. Lord, that I might be made whole. You believe I can do this? It's all about belief, wasn't it? Calling forth the image of Jesus out of us. Why? Not so he can deliver us out of the dilemma, the struggle, the fear, the pain, the agony but so he can restore the image of Christ and we can have continual communion with him. That's why he wants to do this. So we don't have to come to God and play, let's make a deal. God, if you do this, I'll do this. 
Too many folks out there playing, let's make a deal with God. God, if you'll bail me out of this situation, this mess I got myself into, I'll do this. Ain't going to happen. Just got to choose Him. You just got to fall in love with Jesus. Praise the Lord. That's good. Why? Because you've been created in His image. and He seems to think you were worth the blood of His Son. He loves you enough that He'll take all the mess... He's the only one that can do it. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord. All things. He's the only one that can take bad and make good out of it. The only one. And then he says to the Thessalonians, he says, when you get in a mess, give thanks for it. Give thanks for the mess? No, give thanks that a good God, a loving God, is going to get you out of it. That's his just give him praise. He lose. Oh, preacher. Tell you something. Yeah. I was born in high school. I'm telling you. I'm not talking to the novice people. A lot of folks come in the body of Christ and they say, oh, y'all don't. Oh, we, it could be hell for us, but we've cho- chosen for Jesus to make it heaven. heaven. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, no. All right. So why don't we just compassion? All the trials, the things that we go through, the struggles, they're all there. We'll, we'll get through them. We'll go through them with joy. James even said, Brothers and sisters, you can get to this place where when the trials come, you say, with joy. Walk through them as joyful believers, joyful Christ followers. Wow. You'll get through a lot, a lot better. A lot better and, and because if you understand the purpose, the purpose the trial came is the purpose of maturing you in the spirit. So the trials are so special. Right? It doesn't seem like We forget, see, because 
pleasurable things, like the icing on the cake. It's kind of like cotton candy. It's just like sweet candy. It just dissolves. We don't remember it. Teaching about spiritual things. In those things, you will experience the greatest, greatest growth and maturity with your father. He's the perfect reflection of God. That's the same. He's creator, heir, perfect. His word, we talked about this last week, his word spoke all this into existence. Why? Because his word is made powerful. We are sustained by his word. I point you to the word of God tonight. A lot of y'all are running around here and you're still moaning about the darkness. Still curse in the darkness. How bad it's been, how bad you've got it, what you're going to do. Pray for this. You just want God to be your little Santa Claus in the sky. You want him to bail you out of your trouble. It's not Santa Claus. It's not your personal bellhop. Okay? What moves God? Faith. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. How does faith work? By love. Faith works by love. So you've got to be in love with God, and you've got to develop faith. How do I develop, his fa- develop faith? Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of the Lord. Find out what God says about it. He um, got saved when he was in the but he's 63 now, and he just got filled with the Holy Spirit this evening. And we prayed for him that about four months ago that he was sick and he was still alive. Still alive. Yeah. Still alive in the spirit field. He's got. He's got. He's got the double whammy working for him right now. When you've got when you've been healed and, and the Holy Ghost is in is inside of you. You see, it's the word of the Lord that sustains us now. Because if God removed his word out of you, okay, if he moved his word out of you, the the immediate thing the devil would do is kill you. That's immediately what he would do. Okay? And some of you, he's trying, he's trying to destroy you. And you don't know how to stop him. You're powerless. Everything you've tried, you've tried self-reprobation, you've tried a dose of do better, you've tried, well, I'll do nothing, nothing, it's not working. The only thing that's sustained is the word of God. Why? Because the word of God is settled. God doesn't argue with the devil. He says, this is the way it is. As a matter of fact, if you really get if you really get in communion and fellowship with God, since the, since God created the devil, some of you didn't know that, but but he's a created being created by God, and he cannot operate outside of the parameters of the permission of God. How do we know that? Because he went before the throne of God and accused Job and said, "Let me take everything, you, take all he's got, but don't touch his life." God set the bounds. You got it? So you may get tested in a lot of areas. But ultimately, what the enemy wants to do is, is take you alive. See? Why? Because your life is the most precious thing to God. There is. It's not how much money you got. It's not how successful you are. It's about whom you're becoming in Christ's people. Are you fulfilling the image of God that's at work in you? The only thing that's going to sustain you is the power of the word of the living God. Okay? The more words you get inside of you, the more you'll know who you are. Do do you know him as Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides? Do you know him as Jehovah Rapha, the Lord who heals? Okay? On and on and on and on and on. 
the names of God, the names of God, the names of Jesus, replete throughout the Bible. Jesus is seen all throughout the Old Testament. He's, he's revealed throughout the entire Old Testament, then especially throughout the New Testament. Well, why is that? Why is that important? Because he he sustains the word. So we grow, we draw our strength from him. We will get weak. The flesh is going to get weak. The flesh is going to feel like giving up. It'll give out, and it takes the strength of the word of the Lord to sustain. It. Some of you may feel like, boy, you've been through it. 2013 did not start off the way you thought it was going to start off. It was pretty tough. Pretty rough. You feel like you're in the desert and there's a 50 mile an hour gale wind blowing and you're doing nothing but eating desert dust. And you think, my God, what in the world is going on here? I want to tell you, God, if you'll stay with the Lord and you'll let his word sustain you, he's going to lead you into the promised land. Amen. Amen. You know why? I, I'm going I'm to preach my sermon for Sunday a week from now. But I'm going to tell you something. You know what his word becomes? It becomes like fire shut up in your body. And when you use it, it becomes like a fireball. Revelation 21 and 22 bears it out. You can read it for yourself. But when you start, when you start hurling the word, it, it God God has a He has a bat. It's called a harping bowl. It's called the harping bowl. And he's got a bat up there where he stores up the prayers of the saints. And you might be on the verge of your breakthrough. But if you let the enemy shut you down. You, you you won't you won't see your breakthrough because you may have just stopped feeling like God was a million miles away from you and that He was not going to answer your prayer. You got to be sustained by His Word because every time you lob one of those fireballs into the prayer into that prayer bowl, it just keeps adding fuel to the fire and God keeps heating it up. What on your behalf, so that the breakthrough that you've been praying and seeking Him for comes? Why? Because you're sustained by His Word, because you're created in His image. So, what's the point? Don't give up. Don't give in. Don't give out. Don't quit. Stay with it. Hang in there. But stay with His Word, because His Word's what's going to see you through this. I know it from personal experience. Anybody be a witness to that tonight? In person, it's the word that sustains it. Praise God. Now, so what faith does is helps us to view every experience in life the way God's intended purpose for it should be seen. You can't see things through the lens of the flesh. You have to see it through the light of His Word. You have to see it through the lens of the Holy Ghost. You have to see it the way God intended for you to see it. If you're seeing stuff according to the flesh and it looks bleak and dark and hopeless, then you need to ask the Holy Ghost, help me see this the way the Father sees it. Holy Spirit, help me shine a new light on it. Help me to see it from God's perspective. Show me a new dimension here. Why? But if you don't, the image of the Father will die in you. Because it's the enemy's intent to discourage you, distract you, defeat you. And we're all, we've already got enough to contend with in these five senses of the flesh. Because the image of God died with sin. Moeller pointed that out to us. And what does the enemy want to do? Make us feel like we can't make it, we can't do it, we can't overcome How can you love others? How, how can we love others if we don't love ourselves? You can't. You won't love others. You won't share Christ if you don't see yourself and see others as Christ sees. That's what this whole thing that 
See, love is a portion of the heart. It's a portion of my heart where I make choices. I make decisions. And I should, it, should, it, sh, it should be my heart is firmly fixed on you, O oh God. Even when my heart is overwhelmed, lead me to the rock that's higher than I am. Love is the portion of the heart that never changes. I'm the Lord God. I change not. Our situations are continually changing. It's a new word for you. We're continually in flux. Continuous flux. Here we go. Yes, sir. Was true of Joseph. Wasn't it? Was true of Joseph. His brothers didn't like it. It wound up getting him in a world of hurt. But it was it was the plan of God because if He hadn't sent him on a, sent him on ahead, he wouldn't have wound up in the palace in second command under Pharaoh, and his family would starve to death. But God prepped him for that. If we could remember that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and are the call according to his purpose. That remember when, when Joseph they finally met up with his brothers and said, You meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. Yeah. And if, if we can remember that every situation in our life, it, no matter what it is, God will change it around for those that love him. You know, he'll change it around and make it for good. Uh, Spurgeon wrote, uh, there is nothing bad that will ever happen to the Christian. Death brings you to your reward. Mm -hmm. It's sickness brings you to your it, it brings you to your knees. I mean, nothing. Where others die, we live. Mm -hmm. We live. You know, I, I, I just love it. Well, well, I'll go what you said too about praying. Uh, in the book of Revelation, it says, and another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given to him much incense, that he should offer it with the prayers of the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. Uh, if we remember what incense is, Christ became that sweet smelling incense. And you know, sometimes, have you ever prayed in your prayer feels like it was pumped over down the side and a little higher? Yeah. You know, and, <laughs> Hello. But, but you know what, in, in, in our own self, you think, oh, that prayer wasn't even worthy. It wasn't even worthy to even send it out. But we forget that God mixes our prayers. With his incense, with Christ's incense. And that's why we become worthy. And, and as we pray, and God makes us the incense of Christ to become a sweet smelling savor in his nostrils. And if we can remember that our prayers are not in vain, and, and that we're not to be weary in well doing, and that all things are going to work together, because what? Satan meant for our destruction. Remember, he, Jesus even told Peter, he said, Satan has desired to sift you like wheat. That's what he's doing to all of us. None of us are exempt. Satan wants to sift us like wheat. Sure. That's what he wants to do, discourage us. Mm -hmm. But if we remember, our prayers are not in vain. They're mixed with his incense. That God turns everything around in our life and makes it good. And it looks bad, and the situation looks bad, like you said the other day. And I've had to come to the point in my life where I said, Lord, I don't, I don't have any control of my circumstance. Oh, my God. I, I'm, you know, I'm totally uh, giving it over to you, trusting in you. And the older I get, see, I can see that the older and, and the more I study the Word, I can see that I can do this. Now, when I was a young woman, I would have been crying, oh, God, what have I not done right? You know, I, I haven't prayed enough, fasted enough, given enough. I can, I've just not done something enough for all this stuff to come to me. But but it comes to us to, for God to, to try us that the the uh, trial of your faith is much more precious than gold. And God does not willingly afflict the children of men. But if we remember when we pray, our prayers are not in vain, that all things are going to work together for the good. And I'm telling you, one of these days, this is all going to wind down. And all of this, all this stuff. One of these days, and this is what Charles Spurgeon said. He said, "One of these days, 
this hand that aches is going to win the crane. And one of these days, these old feet that has walked these old dusty roads are going to walk out the streets of New Jersey. And one of these days, his heart has been broken in two for God the rest that remains for the people to come. One of these days. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. See, uh, that's the good news now. That's the good news for us. See, even when we sorrow, what remains is hope because love never fails. If you don't learn anything else out of this class, you're gonna you're gonna hear this, you're gonna hear this a million times. Love never fails. If love fails, then we're all we're we're just miserable. We're just miserable wrecks. If if love can't sustain us and offer us hope, then scripture says we're of all men most miserable. See. We're miserable. That's the reason you see a lot of people and you wonder why they're so restless. Why are they miserable? They have no hope. They're hemmed in. See? Um, I, 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 I'm hesitating to share with you a little story that I feel the release of the Holy Ghost on because it, 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 Sister Murphy prompted me in the word that you just used. And, uh, Yesterday, I spent about an hour on the phone with my daughter, Rita, Rita and Vic. Uh, for 30 days, she had been on fast and personal devotion time in preparation for what is termed her personal quest. And uh, for six days, beginning last Tuesday, she went to a Really, a, a villa that happens to be a, about a five million dollar mansion that the president and CEO that used to own FedEx home. He was a Christian man. They donated this to this, this group of Christian businessmen who were members of churches, formed the board, and began this, this personal quest for believers. Pastor Robert Morris, some of you won't know him, but he's the Pastor of about a 30,000 member church there in it's either Houston or Dallas, the Gateway Church. And uh, he went revolutionizing his life, sent all of his staff. He tell me that when they bring a new staff member on in their church and they've got four campuses around the Metroplex area, that they hand him a laptop and say, log on and go ahead and book your quest because that's the first thing you're going to do when you're going on the quest. And uh, he said, if, if, if I could make it mandatory for people to join our church the first, before they could ever join, I'd send them on a quest. So six days Rhea spent on, on the quest. Long story short, it's personal time alone with the Lord. There's a group of 23 ladies. It was teaching. There was never any dull moments, no downtime. Uh, on Thursday, uh, she was given her family. There were 37 people, one of which was her mother and myself, her husband, and all written her along with hands and uncles and grandparents. She's reading those, and the Holy Spirit's just messing her up. Just messed her up big time. Wrestling with the Lord come Friday on the quest and looking for some breakthrough and said, God, I'm not, what's going on? She'd go into the leaders and say, I'm seeking the Lord for breakthrough. They'd say, we're not God. We don't presume to be. Go back out there to hear from Him. And seek Him. I said, "What? They're on the right track." So by by, by Friday, no breakthrough. God's a million miles away. Now she's having a wonderful time. She's learning a lot. But I mean, she's really. I mean, God, I I need I, I need to hear from you. Saturday morning, she gets up. She goes out to prayer. Holy Spirit starts just divine downloading. It says, Rhea, you're fighting with the wrong tool. It says, God, I thought I was doing all the right things. I'm a pastor's wife. I'm a worship leader. I love you. 
I worship you. I'm going after you. I said, yeah, that, all that's good, Rhea, but you're fighting with the wrong tools. She said, what is it? I said, you're fighting with the tool of control. I want to give you a new tool. I said, you need to stop trying to control it. You try to control your husband. You try to control people around you. You try to control your church, your, your children. You want to control everything. Why? Because you want to fix it. Because you don't want to let me deal with it. I need to deal with you, and I need to deal with them. You prompted that when you said, I'm not in control. Fix everything. Fix everything and everybody. Gotta fix it. Because by nature, we're fixers, aren't we? We're supposed to fix it. We won't even turn things over to God. Because we won't, the only time we can we will turn it over to God is when we are at the, our wits' end. We've tried everything we know to do. Shouldn't we have started with Him first? Yes. He said, the Holy Spirit said, Rhea, I'm going to give you new tools to fight this. She said, okay, what is it? He said, trust and obedience. I think some hymn writer got it right when he said, to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey. Oh, wow. You mean to say, well, it's really harder than we think because we've, we've got to, see, God won't step in as long as the flesh is going to touch it. And I know we've said it in Pentecostal circles millions of times. Let go and let God. Let go and let God. And we're hanging on with everything we've got for dear life. Yeah. You can't touch it. The, the flesh will curse it every time. And sometimes, something that's either on the person we're trying to fix or us that we're trying to fix, God's trying to strip something out of us that may hold the key to our breakthrough and our deliverance in it. And we're holding on to something of our past. A hurt, a difficulty, a struggle, a bondage. And she said, I saw a vision of control. She said, I saw what you were going through when you were going through it. And your family left you. <clears throat> and they walked out on you when y'all were all involved in ministry together and you were doing all the right things. And you had to release control. She said, I saw it. I saw it in a vision while I was there. She said, I saw the Holy Spirit during that time. And she said, because, Dad, you don't know the times I've, I've, I've just laid in my shower on the floor crying out to God, just squalling my eyes out. God, why did you let this happen to my family? We were so close. Why did you allow us to be blown apart? Why did you allow these things to happen? Why did you allow this to come? And she said, I saw in the Spirit the Holy Ghost standing in the midst of all of this with giant bolt cutters cutting bolts and steel wires and chains and bondages for the purpose of releasing control. Because our family was so bound up in control. So you can say you love, but see you get, you get hung up in loyalty if you don't play the family game. By that, by the family game, I mean you've got to do certain things in order to stay in the favor of the family. And if you mess up, you're an outcast. You're the black. You ever heard that? Well, I was the black sheep of the family. Some of y'all remember this stuff all the way back to your childhood. Well, I was the black sheep. I didn't do everything mom and daddy wanted done, so I'm out of here. Okay? You know what happened? That control the image of God, of who God created you to be and intended you to be. I, 
The reason I know this, folks, is because I've walked through it and I've lived it. And God's liberated me from that. My identity early on, as a, as a growing up as a young man in the image of who God wanted me to be, was wrapped up in I had to have my father's approval. I, I'm not saying this is a knock against them. I just, this was what I depended on. If, I, if they said, you preached good today, son. You did this good today, son. It's good to hear that, from them, but it can't control you. If that controls you, then you're looking for the approval of people. And that controls you. You have to look to the approval of God. It has to be the approval of your father. Oh my God. Now that, see, that rips you. Especially when you've been used to it. It kind of feeds your flesh. It feeds your ego. It kind of strokes the ego. Oh, well, they think good of me. They think nice of me. But then God starts stripping stuff out of your life and said, you don't have control anymore. Make of yourself no reputation. Really? What does that mean, God? If folks know, knew the worst thing about you there is to know, would they still love you? There's some love for you. That's like I tell our children here at our school. Don't go sow your wild oats and then turn around and pray for a crop there. Because you don't mock God. Whatever you sow is what you're going to reap. Okay? I thought I could do that and get away with it. I sowed wild oats. And they come back. How do they manifest? When you have to stand and tell your children something you did back when you was a teenager that wound up manifesting and haunting you all of your life. And you thought you'd never have to face it again. Oh, well, it's under the blood. Yeah, it's under the blood, but you may have to wind up. Hello. But the wonderful lesson learned for me was that once it's out there, not that, and I'm not talking about just getting out here and airing your dirty laundry. I'm talking about things that the Holy Spirit stripping out of your life that He exposes and brings into the light. Okay? So when he brings it into the light, it's so that he can line you up with the image of who Jesus is inside of you. Because before, my past was defining me. Oh my God, did anybody hear that? There's where some of you are tonight. Your past is still dictating and defining who you are. There you are. I'm telling you, it's controlling you. Let go of it. Your past in Jesus no longer defines who you are. No longer dictates to you who you are. You know what the Holy Spirit showed me? As soon as that was brought into the light and exposed, shackles fell off. I've, I stepped through the door of freedom and I've been there ever since. And I learned the lesson. Oh my God, I will never go back there to bondage again. I won't go back to bondage again. This is freedom. This is freedom. And so now, it's not a big deal to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. Why? Because He's already humbled. You're already broken. And it's okay to be broken. Because then He grinds you up into powder, puts you back into clay bath, puts you back on the wheel and starts forming and fashioning. Because why? Before you had a vessel that was so full of yourself, he couldn't use you. But now he can mold you and shape you and pour, it, pour, it, pour that vessel full of himself. You need to be full of him. Okay? So somebody here, I'm telling you, let go of your past. Let go of it. It's okay. If he wants to bring it to light and expose it, it's okay. That's why this preacher is talking about loving people that come in here, that the world, the world don't even love them. They're outcasts from the world. We we gotta we gotta love people. I listen, I've had people come into my office, well, I'm visiting here for the first time. Well, it's nice to meet you. 
I just need you to know I'm just out of jail and I'm a pedophile. You're what? Okay, we love you. I've had people come and sit in my office. I need you to know I'm hung up. I'm in bondage. I'm in unnatural affection. I don't love men, I love women. We, we got it's, it's a real fight in here. Okay. Can we love those kind of people? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yes. How are we ever going to call the image of God out of it? If the Jesus in us, and we don't know that we're loved by Him, and we can risk loving other people. For too long, the church has said, clean up and you can come in here. Don't come in here dirty. Don't come in here messed up. Clean up. So God says, okay, I can't let you fish for men. You just keep the aquarium. <laughs> Right? Right? I walked up to the to, to the podium at University Church sitting over there on 275 off Fowler Avenue and owned the pastor's podium every Sunday when he when he walked up there. Gold plated plaque sitting right there on his on his pulpit when he went up to preach the gospel. Asked this question Will we be fishers of men or keepers of the query? Which is it? Which is it? You can't come in here, you're not our kind. You stink, you don't have the right lifestyle, you're drunk, you're on drugs, you're, you're, you're messed up. <coughs> you're not our kind. Well, how are, they going to, how are they going to be our kind if we don't show them the image of Jesus laid out through yeah. us? Can't we do that, church? Yeah. I mean, I think, I think the power of the Holy Spirit, because the Word of God is active and alive and sharper than any two-edged sword, it can cut to the chase. It just gets right to the heart of the matter. It says, hey, it's all it's not about you. It's about Jesus. It's about his love for you. It's about his love for you. Everybody going, I got it so bad, I got this, I got this, I got this. No, no, it's not about you. It's about the blood of Jesus. It's about what Jesus did. God loved you enough. He says you're worth the blood of my son. And that's our message. That's our mission. So we gotta tell people that. Is that okay? So stop letting your past define who you are. I don't know why I'm harping on this tonight because I wanted to get on over to Mark 4 and get into the, to the, the parable of the sower because that talks about the love of Jesus. How easy it is for the enemy to steal the word. We've been talking about the word. But it's who we are. It's who we are. That's it. Who we are becoming that's important to God, not what we do. We think what we do defines us. Oh, I'm going to clean up. I'm going to be better. I'm going to talk better. I'm going to act better. I'm going to live better. Nope. So you're going, who are you going to become? Who are you going to be? Well, I'm a nice guy. Well, you're trying to protect your reputation. Because you want people to think you're a nice person. You're not in control, number one. Number two, you're a mess. That's it. That's a plain and simple. Two things I'll simplify for you. You're not in control and you're a mess. And that's all of us, including the preacher. If he asks me to make of myself no reputation, he's going to ask you the same thing. You're going to go where he wants you to go. No reputation. What about the point of perception that we don't want to be in control anymore? Well, well, and see, that's the whole point. When we're young, we think we've got the world by the tail. Boy, we can just do it. But I tell you, God's got eternity on this side. We thought it was time. God can wait you out. A thousand years is like a day with him. He can wait you out. Do you got a little frost on the rooftop? And you don't have the energy that you once had when you were 15, 16 years old. You just can't do it. And you don't go, you don't go doing all of what you thought you used to be doing. You start, I lost my one I lost my one I'm not in control, God. I think I better I think I better let you have control of this thing. Isn't that good? Boy, and, and you know what's taught me? There's such a peace there. 
Amen. There really is. Yes. There is. It's not an arrogance. It's just a, it's just a boldness. It, it's it's a confidence in him. It's in him. It's not in anything in the only thing that's in me is, is Jesus. Yeah. And and so what he, he does then is he, he grants you his peace in, in the midst of what what before was turmoil. Right. It was I, I've been there. I, I was so good at it that I could write my own turmoil. I could create my own turmoil. Because I was so fearful, I, I wanted to just figure out how many levels of fear I could get into. So I just create, I just create the levels of fear. Here's how bad it can. It's bad now, but it can get worse, and it can get worse, and get worse, and get worse. Yeah. And so after I after I created all of that, then I had to, then I had to live with all of that. The Holy Spirit delivered me. I had to work at this place. I had to work at it. I've told you messages before. I got confronted right out there by the air conditioners on the West Wing. They were just walking the parking lot. Walking the parking lot. After my son set an open hot chair. Two years old. Get a little two year old with 22 staples down his chest. He's had his rib cage split up and they've gone into a carry. A hole in his heart. You don't know if you'll ever see him alive again or not. And the Holy Spirit says, Okay, is fear working for you? No. I said, No, I'm really sick of it. He said, I don't know how to do faith. You want, you want to try living by faith? You want to live by faith? I said, God, I can't. Faith won't let me control it. I've got to trust you. Faith says I have to trust you. That you're going to work all things for my good. I don't know if I can believe that or not. He said, it's all you got going for you right now, brother. It's all you got going. You're either going to live by fear or you're going to live by faith. Folks, when I chose faith, he cut me loose. All the bondages left. Peace. Have I ever had an anxious moment again? Yeah, Paul said in Philippians 4, I believe. But he said, really, if you'll work on this, you can be anxious for nothing. Mm -hmm. Well, what do I do when I am anxious? He said, in everything, by prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to the Lord. And, and the God of peace will guard your heart and mind. He'll garrison an army to keep your heart and your mind. He, he, in other words, he won't let the enemy or anybody else, this is Revelation, he won't allow the enemy or anybody else to come and steal his word. He won't. He'll garrison an army to protect. You know why? Because he watches over his word. Wow. Hallelujah. That's why he says, he says, when you're going through this, when you're going through the fiery trial, rejoice. So you didn't get it the first time. Again, I say rejoice. So, so learn to discipline your mind. Finally, brothers, whatever is lovely, whatever is noble, whatever is pure, whatever is praiseworthy, whatever is a good report, keep your mind on yes. Keep your mind on those things. Wouldn't it be easy? Just as, isn't it just as easy to choose to think about lovely things as it is about fearful things, about destructive things? It sure it is. But you have to discipline your spirit. You have to discipline your heart, your mind. You have to choose to think about that. I gotta work work at that. I'm not gonna fear when my heart is overwhelmed, leading to the rock that's higher than I. The Lord God is a sun and shield, he gives grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. Oh Lord of hosts, how blessed is the man that trusts in me. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That's where I put my trust. I trust in him. I'm not going to let that circumstance and situation define me. I'm praying prayers of agreement about that every day. You know what I'm praying over you guys? You know what I'm praying? The manifold jubilee of the Lord. You know what jubilee says? Let's break it down. This is a time for things that have been troubling you. God says, 
Jubilee is about rest. Look it up in the Old Testament. They let the land rest. Relationships rested. They sought after God. They rested in the Lord. It was like a, a, an extended, continual Sabbath. They just enjoy, and they enjoyed feasts, debts. If there was debt on the land, debt on the house, debt in relationship, it was all canceled. I said, "Oh God, oh God, why can't it be? Why can't it be?" He might be talking about it. Remember the couple we had here a few, a few months ago, Lester and Holly, that sang in our morning worship service? Mm -hmm. I took them to lunch. They both sang, in, or Lester did, was the lead tenor in the Voices of Lee, which is Lee University, one of Lee University's premier acapella <clears throat> When he graduated from there, um, they had. Uh, he, he started a barbershop quartet group and they went and won the national barbershop competition. They were booking all over the place that money had a nice house in the Nashville area. Had two top hits in the top ten uh, Christian song one one double words for them. Had money rolling in like crazy. Had two houses. And within less than a year's time, they were bankrupt. He said, you talk about ticked at God. I was ticked. I was mad. He said, God, what have you, God, what have you done to me? He said, I, I was I was using some pretty tough language on God. And said, it's, it's, it's really a good thing that, that God is gracious and gracious and merciful. That he let me live because I was really in, in doubt. He said, God, you've ruined me. You've ruined me. I'm bankrupt. We've had to file bankruptcy. He said, God spoke to me. He said, that's all right to get your attention. Because you were so full of yourself, you were trusting in uncertain riches and still trusting in He said, so when I take it all, the next time I bless you, I give you the reward and the fruit of your labor. You'll know that it came from me and you'll appreciate it because you know where it came from. Getting it? Getting it? Uh -huh. Got you, really? Yeah, I have. I have. See, sometimes God lets us go on into that. He won't stop you, He'll let you go right on into it. He told Jonah to go to him, but he didn't go. He had it for time. He let him get on the ship. He let him head on out. Got out at sea. Storm comes up. They're having to throw cargo over. He's in the bottom of the in the bottom of the ship, sleeping. Thinks he's escaped God. Has not been found out. But God's allowing all this to happen. Throwing him overboard, the fish gets him, and he's in the belly for three days, just like Jesus. He's in there. God, what have you done? You've ruined you. You've ruined me. But see, it's in that place. It was three days in the belly of the whale that he could get willing to say, God, you get me out of here. Because see, God's intent was to redeem the nation. And he was the prophet. He was the type of Jesus. He had the message of redemption. And he was unwilling to go deliver to a nation the redemptive word that God said. That, but God let him go through all that to get him where he wanted to be. Is anybody getting this? He may let you go through some things to get you where he wants you to be. Why? Because he loves you? Because he wants to redeem you? He'll let you go, and you find out he sends you in. Uh-oh, I'm in the fish. I'm in the fish's belly. 
And then we say, God, God, what about you all? I did everything I was supposed to do. Do you have some kind of idea? You know, how's that working out for me? Yeah. Because we make our own decisions, go our own way, and think we can ask God bless it. Come with me, uh-huh. God bless what I've decided to do. Oh, my. I'm not going to have to realize that you're fighting with the wrong tool. You're fighting. We can be in spiritual warfare, boy. We're just out there slaying devils. We're all over the place. You're fighting with the wrong tool. So she breaks our heart. She just she she messes her mother and I up against us. She said, I read your letter. She said, Did you and Dad read each other's letter? She said, We didn't read them on purpose. He wanted the Holy Ghost to minister. She said, You won't believe how much I like that. You won't believe what you said when you messed me up. The power of your influence totally changed. God is working in you through what you said. She said, you guys don't know. And she said, I've tried to control it. I've tried to force forgiveness in the family. I've tried to go after it and make certain things happen. And God said, I can do it too. She said, Mom, Dad, it's this. In the name of what I thought of you. In the name of what I wanted to see you to do. And all the time I was just beating you. Thank you for being loving. To let me beat you. I still love you. Sometimes parents have to love you. I'm your mother. I'm your father. Don't you ever forget. See, we can call that into account because that's what we were taught. And you will respect me. The Bible says honor. Sometimes we have to do things. And it's not like until later until the Holy Spirit can teach our children. We can see we've even got to turn our children over to the Holy Spirit and let Him teach us. We just keep living the love of Jesus. You just keep loving. That's what we were doing with her. We just kept loving her. We just loved her. Just loved her. Did you know those six days were the most profitable days? Because if she could come back and say to us, I now see it. I see now that your unconditional love is what I have to show to John and Carol. Otherwise, I'll try to control them. I want to mold them and shape them into the academic quiz kids that I was. I cried out. I cried out. I, in 
Nine times out of ten, it'll be, uh, I'm going to change you. I'm going to change you, and I'm going to help you see it. Well, I went through something similar with my son, like when he was a teenager. And we were going to church, but we came over to the car church that was just a neighborhood. And uh, I was like, my house, I was trying to control. But one night, he got out. See, there's something about humility. Humility is not about weakness. Right. It's not about weakness. Right. It takes an inner, it takes an inner working of the Holy Ghost to humble yourself under the mighty hand of God. And He says, if you can do that, if you will do that, if you'll choose to do that, in due time, I'll exalt you. I'll lift you up. Praise God. Praise God. Uh-huh. Your whole family. See, when I get, when my kids get lifted up, I get lifted up. I wouldn't take anything for what I heard yesterday from my daughter. You see, she's still got 30 more days of it. She said, we've been staying up until 2 o'clock every night processing all that I've been through. Journaling it down what God's doing. Her husband's already went on. He, he apologized to her and, and, and said things that she began to She apologized to him. She said, I did, I, God showed me I had to take my rightful place alongside of you, not trying to be the matriarch of the family and lord it over you. Bless God, there won't no man control me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, she told me before they got married, she said, Bless God, brother. I'm going to tell you right now, I'm more than enough woman for you, and don't you ever forget. She wanted to be most of the time. <laughs> most of the time. But it's a whole different, I mean, the, 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 the six day, and, but this has been a process. The Lord's been leading her through through this whole process, but it just came, it, it all came to bear. To where I've got to be, we're, we're partners in this together. I was taken out of his side. We're to walk side by side. I'm not to walk behind him. I'm not to walk in front. We're to be side by side. That's why God took me out of his side. Because positionally, that's where I'm supposed to be. And I'm called a helper. I'm to be his helpmate. How close? Yeah. And see, there's, there's another whole message right there because men in our culture, by nature, have relinquished the authority. That high, see, because high priest, high priest means provider, protector, shield. He even apologized. Listen to this. Here's one thing you do that, that can mess you up. He said, I let people, I let people in the church come and criticize you and lambaste you and find fault with you or the things they didn't like or didn't agree with because I thought it would toughen you up and make you be able to stand on your own two feet. Because you need to be tough. If you're going to be in the ministry, you've got to be tough. He said, little did I know that I was supposed to be there to be your protector. You getting this? Because 
it's in those moments that she felt abandoned. She got weary in the battle. Oh, she got beat up all the time. People would whip out the verbal machete and just bring her down to size. It was either endure through what was said to you and about you. You know, when people say all manner of evil against you falsely for the sake of Christ. Oh, is it going to toughen you? Yeah. It'll toughen you up all right, but it can destroy you too. It can break you down. Uh -huh. Break you down. Absolutely. And we do that to each other. We do that in relationships. And God didn't call us to do that. And men have relinquished their right because they're supposed to be there to be nurturer and protector and intercessor and provider and shield. Okay? Jesus said as for Paul or Jesus, as Christ loved the church, yeah. men might all ought to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself to so, so, so every man is high priest. Oh, you want to be high priest? Okay, here's the prerequisite. Lay down your law. Lay down your agenda. Lay down your wants. Lay down your desires. Be prepared to die for it. Your wife and your kids. That's the prerequisite. If you're prepared to lay your life down, that's the way Christ would be laid down his cross. There he is. So, and, and there's the manifestation of that kind of that kind of love. Okay, it, it it'll it'll divest you of the of the title jerk real quick. It'll get you out of there. It'll it'll it, and the Holy Spirit can can elevate you. Okay. That's why, that's why in, in our culture today, we're, we're still doing what was, what was going on in the garden. We're still doing what was going on in the garden. Men and women are using covenant relationship to manipulate each other. And that's never the way God designed it. It's never the way God designed it. They hurt each other. They lambast each other. They, they, men, men and women both can use money to manipulate and get things. Use it for, for, it's power play. It's for prestige. You don't do it the way I want it. It's my way or the highway. Whichever one's the domineering figure in the relationship, it can be the wife in some occasions. It can be the man in some occasions. And you get too strong when you've got an explosion <laughs> in a relationship. And so what do we do? That's why the Sadducees and Pharisees came to Jesus and said, okay, tell us about this writing and divorcement here. Jesus said, well, it never was God's intent. It never was God's intent. God meant for covenant to be lasting. For death do you part. Moses had to do it because there was such rebellion going on in the camp. The husbands and wives were going to kill each other. And it's still going on today. And God hates He hates it. You know why he hates it? Because God was divorced. He divorced Israel. Mm -hmm. He knows the betrayal. He knows the heart. Mm -hmm. He explains it. And he hates it because he has he experienced it. But he said, I'm not. He finally made up his mind. He said, I'm not going to give you the right to divorce me. I'm married to you. And you read in the book of Hosea, and you see how Hosea married the prostitute, but he wouldn't her back. Show them what you look like. Show them what you look like. Here's how you hurt. Here's how you get me. How, how you get me. But I'm still going to go get you. I'm going to pull you out of the prostitution. You've gone off in rebellion. You've hardened your heart. You've stiffened your neck. You've been disobedient. You've gone after your own way instead of the way I prescribed for you. You've forgotten the ways that I taught you. That should have been passed down from generation to generation. You forgot it. And you've gone pouring after your own gods. After your own things. You're putting everything else ahead of me. You're putting materialism ahead of me. You're putting things ahead of me. You're putting relationships ahead of me. I'm first. I'm the first priority. Don't. Don't relax. Don't relax. And went off with her lovers. And left the children. Mm -hmm. Actually, he, he even went to buy them all. He 
brought her back. She was on the auction block. He was yep. selling He and his wife. When he brought her back. And even the children they had together. It denoted the heartache, but it also brought about the restoration. Yes, and the Lord and the said, whole thing. No longer will you be called, and I forgot the word for it, which meant specifically that things now you to be Yeah. You're married. You're married. You're not forsaken. Oh, yeah. Now you are married. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, and it's sometimes it's hard to say that to people in the body of Christ that we, we love. I had to say that to a couple one time. You know, they came to me after service. I'd been, I'd been preaching about that. And uh, preaching along those lines, this sweet lady came in. She said, I'm in the middle of a divorce right now from a 25-year abusive relationship. My husband's been beaten for 25 years. And she said, and so... I've moved in over here with the, with the guy. I said, are you sleeping in the same bed? Well, we have been. I said, get out. Get out. I said, you got to stop singing. You can eat crackers in my bed anytime, baby. <laughs> get him out. Because it's adultery. Mm -hmm. well, why is that? Because you come in here won't me to t tell you that the blessing of God, the favor of God will be on your life. But how are you going to have that and you're not doing what God tells you to do? You can't do it. So she did it. They started growing in Jesus. Next thing I know, said, well, okay, I'm out of the abusive relationship. I said, well, y'all need to, y'all need to court for about six, eight months. Maybe a year, so it'll be a year. Finally, they come and said, I think we'll get married. We're going to do it the Lord's way. Okay, good. Do it the way God says do it. Okay? Get rid of your past. Get a hold of the image of God. Put God in the first place. Let Him be in control. Now, I, I, I went down this road tonight because I felt the leading of the Holy Spirit. What I want y'all to learn to do, and I was going to say this to you, we're going. <laughs> if you're in Christ, you're a new creation. The old is gone. Everything's new. Now, here's what that says to us. The new image of Jesus is being formed in you. Don't ever give place to the old. Don't. Don't do like Lot's wife did. You look back. Mm -hmm. You're going somewhere new. You're new. <clears throat> so don't give place to the former things. Okay. Don't don't let the stuff don't let that stuff that used to be define who you are. All right. You're you're going on to to the thing. The image of Jesus is now being called forth out. Of be informed in you. And the more you put his word in you, and the more you listen to the Holy Ghost for his guidance and revelation into the word that you're taking in, the more he'll begin to reveal who you are. That's who you're finding out. It's who you are in Christ Jesus. You're growing. You're growing up in him. Now, here's where I was headed with this. If you'll, if you'll, if you'll work diligently, okay, because a lot of the things that we do in our culture, we look for the approval of people. And it's okay for people to say nice things about us. I'm not saying that for people just need for us to feel like we're a Christian. People just need to be blasting us and beating us up. No. Well, here's where I'm headed. God wants to teach you. When we say in Him we live and move and have our own. Learn to flow in the Holy Spirit. By flow, I mean out of your enemy's being flow rivers of living water. Okay? The flow of the Spirit leads you into the fresh thing that God would reveal to you. No matter what the situation. Okay? So, so the flow of the Holy Spirit always says, let God unfold it for you. Don't rush it. 
Don't rush it. That's the hardest thing for me to learn that I'm learning as a pastor. I'm, I'm in the learning mode right now, big time. Is is to go and to flow with the Holy Ghost. Okay? And not try to control something and make it happen. Okay? I got preacher buddies, and I used to, I almost got caught up in this trap of preacher buddies that they knew just what sermon to preach, just what scripture to quote, just what to say to work people up into an emotional frenzy to get them going and say, we had church today. It was just the right hot button message to preach. Okay? The flow of the Holy Spirit wants God to unfold. It's not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. It's not by the might of men. It's not by their, their powerful ingenuity and the things that they think they can work up and do. It's the Spirit of the Lord. Spirit of the Lord. And God's moving us into a new season where we're learning to flow in the Spirit. God. Holy Spirit's doing this. In other words, what my daughter said, don't fight with the wrong troops. The weapons of our warfare are not carnal, they're mighty in God. The only way strongholds come down is, is, is to use the mighty tools of God. The mighty tools of God. And the mightiest one in our arsenal is his love. That's the mightiest one. Because he said, when you use that one, there's not even, when you get to the highest dimension of the love of God, there's not even a law in this. Figure that one out. He said, the smartest lawyers and the smartest law books that have ever been written, they ain't even a law against the love that we're talking about. You can't condemn it. You can't accuse it. You can't do nothing but just go, I marvel. It's too wonderful for me to think and entertain the thoughts of it. That is messed up and as unforgiving as wretched and debaucherous. I was like a wave of the sea foaming out my own shame. And this Galilean, this rose of Sherry, this bright and morning star, stepped into the mess of my life. And said, peace be still to the trouble ones. Peace be still. Changed me. Picked me up out of a miry clay. I was sent quicksand. I was down to the county. And he set me on a rock and established me. And I decided to stay there forever. Because I've been through some turbulence. One writer said, it's kind of like I've been through many dangers, toils, and snares. Grace brought me safe thus far. Grace has brought me safe thus far. Don't underestimate the power of His grace. The power of His grace. Paul talks about it all the time. We'll do a study on it eventually. But, but the power of His grace is the power to live the overcoming life that Jesus shows for us. The power. The power. That's what makes it amazing. That's my. It, it's not just the same. He gives me the power to live this out, overcoming every day. I'm an overcomer every day. Why? Because of his grace. Because of his grace. That's why I love being merciful. you got to practice being merciful. God delivers his church. He's delivering us now from judgment. He didn't call us to be judgmental. He called us to be merciful. That's when you're blessed, when you're merciful. What do the merciful do? Blessed are the merciful. They'll inherit. Do they inherit? They'll obtain mercy. You know, it's better than I thought you did. And you start quoting a chapter and verse like that. My God. Thank you, Jesus. Anybody receive his word tonight? Yeah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. Stand up with me. I just want to pray this prayer tonight. Father, we release control. 
any situation that's been bondage to us, any any area of our lives that we've tried to control, any sin of the past, any any lifestyle of the past that's tried to define who we are in the present. God, we we cut we cut those ties loose. Any tie of control, any any any, any hang up that's created bondage. Lord, we just we just get out those Holy Ghost bolt cutters and we just cut every chain. We just cut every shackle. Because we believe there's an army of intercessors rising up to break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. Lord, we release control to you. Whatever it is we've been trying to control, no longer. No more. No more. Holy Spirit, teach us to trust you. Teach us to obey you. We know your word. It's already planted. It's producing a harvest right now. We've just got to, we got to call in that harvest. Lord, I thank you tonight for, for the ability to trust you. Even when we don't have a clue how it's going to work out. Faith says, I won't be anxious about it. I won't worry about it. I won't fret over it. I won't be fearful because of it. I trust you that you're in charge of it. And I know that you were, your word is planted inside of me. And I, so I confess your word. You are taking all things and working them together for my good. When you do it on my behalf, you're doing it for my children and for my children's children. When you lift me up, the rest of my family will do that. They will be the recipients and the beneficiaries of your favor and your blessing and your righteousness. So Lord, we honor you tonight. We honor you tonight. We declare that you're Lord over all. Because we've been created in your image, fashioned and formed according to your purposes. So, Lord, you just take us and use us and mold us and shape us and fashion us according to your purposes and according to your will. And everything that we have need of will fall into line and fall into place. Because you know the plans that you have for us. You declare it. You said, I, I have plans to give you hope and an expected end. You have a future. You have a home in heaven. And so we praise you for the assurance of that tonight. Our hope is anchored in the Lord. Our hope is in you, God, because you love us. And we know that we have lovingly been fashioned and formed and created in your image. So we're going to stay. We're going to stay. We're going we're to fall deeper and deeper and deeper in love with you. And anytime something comes and tries to get us off of our trust and obedience to you, we're going to do what Galatians 4 says, be anxious for nothing. We're going to be anxious for nothing. We're going to tell God every detail of our lives. And he's going to keep our hearts and minds in the bond of his peace and let us rejoice in the midst of it. We're going to joy in the midst of it. I mean, just give the devil a black eye. I mean, give him a black eye. Just let him know. You're not, going to, you're not going to disrupt my peace. I'm going to rejoice in the Lord. I know we want it, I, I know we want the situation changed instantaneously. We want it removed overnight. But the children of Israel didn't get to the promised land overnight. It was a journey. And this life we're living is a journey. If we'll stay with the Lord, He's going to get us there because he's taking you to a land that flows with milk and honey. You're going to get to taste the honey. And it'll be sweet when you get there. Okay? Praise the Lord. Give me some praise in this place. We'll see you soon.